Chapter 15. The Marriage of Science and Empire How far from the Sun is the Earth? It's a question that intrigued many early modern astronomers, particularly after Copernicus argued that the Sun, rather than the Earth, is located at the center of the universe. A number of astronomers and mathematicians tried to calculate the distance, but their methods provided widely varying results. A reliable means of making the measurement was finally proposed in the middle of the 18th century. Every few years, the planet Venus passes directly between the Sun and the Earth. The duration of the transit differs when seen from different points on the Earth's surface because of the tiny difference in the angle at which the observer sees it. If several observations of the same transit were made from different continents, simple trigonometry was all it would take to calculate our exact distance from the Sun. Astronomers predicted that the next Venus transits would occur in 1761 and 1769. So expeditions were sent from Europe to the four corners of the world in order to observe the transits from as many distant points as possible. In 1761, scientists observed the transit from Siberia, North America, Madagascar, and South Africa. As the 1769 transit approached, the European scientific community mounted a supreme effort, and scientists were dispatched as far as northern Canada and California, which then was a wilderness. The Royal Society of London for the Improvement of Natural Knowledge concluded that this was not enough. To obtain the most accurate results, it was imperative to send an astronomer all the way to the southwestern Pacific Ocean. The Royal Society resolved to send an eminent astronomer, Charles Green, to Tahiti, and spared neither effort nor money. But, since it was funding such an expensive expedition, it hardly made sense to use it just to make a single astronomical observation. Green was therefore accompanied by a team of eight other scientists from several disciplines, headed by botanists Joseph Banks and Daniel Salander. The new team also included artists assigned to produce drawings of the new lands, plants, animals, and peoples that the scientists would no doubt encounter. Equipped with the most scientific instruments that Banks and the Royal Society could buy, the expedition was placed under the command of Captain James Cook, an experienced seaman as well as an accomplished geographer and ethnographer. The expedition left England in 1768, observed the Venus transit from Tahiti in 1969, scouted several Pacific islands, visited Australia and New Zealand, and returned to England in 1771. It brought back enormous quantities of astronomical, geographical, meteorological, botanical, zoological, and anthropological data. Its findings made major contributions to a number of disciplines, sparked the imagination of Europeans with astonishing tales of the South Pacific, and inspired future generations of naturalists and astronomers. One of the fields that benefited from the Cook expedition was medicine. At the time, Ships that set sail to distant shores knew that more than half their crew members would die on the journey. The nemesis was not angry natives, enemy warships, or homesickness. It was a mysterious ailment called scurvy. Men who came down with the disease grew lethargic and depressed, and their gums and other soft tissues bled. As the disease progressed, their teeth fell out, open sores appeared, and they grew feverish, jaundiced, and lost control of their limbs. Between the 16th and 18th centuries, scurvy is estimated to have claimed the lives of about 2 million sailors. No one knew what caused it, and no matter what remedy was tried, sailors continued to die in droves. The turning point came in 1747, when a British physician, James Lind, conducted a controlled experiment on sailors who suffered from the disease. He separated them into several groups and gave each group a different treatment. One of the test groups was instructed to eat citrus fruits, a common folk remedy for scurvy. The patients in this group promptly recovered. Lind did not know what the citrus fruits had that the sailors' bodies lacked, but we now know that it's vitamin C. A typical shipboard diet at the time was notably lacking in foods that are rich in this essential nutrient. On long-range voyages, sailors usually subsisted on biscuits and beef jerky, and ate almost no fruits or vegetables. The Royal Navy was not convinced by Lynn's experiments, but James Cook was. He resolved to prove the doctor right. He loaded his ship with a large quantity of sauerkraut 
and ordered his sailors to eat lots of fresh fruits and vegetables whenever the expedition made landfall. Cook did not lose a single sailor to scurvy. In the following decades, all the world's navies adopted Cook's nautical diet, and the lives of countless sailors and passengers were saved. However, the Cook expedition had another far less benign result. Cook was not only an experienced seaman and geographer, but also a naval officer. The Royal Society financed a large part of this expedition's expenses, but the ship itself was provided by the Royal Navy. The Navy also seconded 85 well-armed sailors and marines, and equipped the ship with artillery, muskets, gunpowder, and other weaponry. Much of the information collected by the expedition, particularly the astronomical, geographical, and meteorological and anthropological data, was of obvious political and military value. The discovery of an effective treatment for scurvy greatly contributed to British control of the world's oceans and its ability to send armies to the other side of the world. Cook claimed for Britain many of the islands and lands he quote discovered, most notably Australia. The Cook expedition laid the foundation for the British occupation of the southwestern Pacific Ocean, for the conquest of Australia, Tasmania, and New Zealand, for the settlement of millions of Europeans in the new colonies, and for the extermination of their native cultures and most of their native populations. In the century following the Cook expedition, the most fertile lands of Australia and New Zealand were taken from their previous inhabitants by European settlers. The native population dropped by up to 90%, and the survivors were subjected to a harsh regime of racial oppression. For the Aborigines of Australia, and to a lesser extent the Maoris of New Zealand, the Cook expedition was the beginning of a catastrophe from which they have never fully recovered. An even worse fate befell the natives of Tasmania. Having survived for 10,000 years in splendid isolation, they were almost exterminated within a century of Cook's arrival. European settlers first drove them off the richest parts of the island, and then, coveting even the remaining wilderness, hunted them down and killed them systematically. Some of the last survivors were hounded into an evangelical concentration camp, where well-meaning but not particularly open-minded missionaries tried to indoctrinate them into the ways of the modern world. The Tasmanians were instructed in reading and writing, Christianity, and various, quote, productive skills, such as sewing cloths and farming. But they refused to learn. They became ever more melancholic, stopped having children, lost all interest in life, and finally chose the only escape route from the modern world of science and progress, death. Alas, science and progress pursued them even to the afterlife. The corpses of dead Tasmanians were seized in the name of science by anthropologists and curators. They were dissected, weighed, and measured, and analyzed in learned articles. The skulls and skeletons were then put on display in museums and anthropological collections. Only in 1976 did the Tasmanian Museum give up for burial the skeleton of Truganini, often thought to be the last full-blooded native Tasmanian who had died a hundred years earlier. The English Royal College of Surgeons held on to samples of her skin and hair until 2002. Was Cook's ship a scientific expedition protected by a military force or a military expedition with a few scientists tagging along? That's like asking whether your petrol tank is half empty or half full. It was both. The scientific revolution and modern imperialism were inseparable. People such as Captain James Cook and the botanist Joseph Banks could hardly distinguish science from empire, nor could luckless Truganini. Why Europe? The fact that people from a large island in the northern Atlantic conquered a large island south of Australia is one of history's more bizarre occurrences. Not long before Cook's expedition, the British Isles and Western Europe in general were but distant backwaters of the Mediterranean world. Little of importance ever happened there. Even the Roman Empire, the only important pre-modern European empire, derived most of its wealth from its North African, Balkan, and Middle Eastern provinces. Rome's Western European provinces were a poor Wild West which contributed little aside from minerals and slaves. Northern Europe was so desolate and barbarous that it wasn't even worth conquering. Only at the end of the 15th century did Europe become a hothouse of important military, political, economic, and cultural developments. 
Between 1500 and 1750, Western Europe gained momentum and became the master of the quote, outer world, meaning the two American continents and the oceans. Yet even then, Europe was no match for the great powers of Asia. Europeans managed to conquer America and gain supremacy at sea, mainly because the Asian powers showed little interest in them. The early modern era was a golden age for the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean, the Safavid Empire in Persia, the Mughal Empire in India, and the Chinese Ming and Qing dynasties. They expanded their territory significantly and enjoyed unprecedented demographic and economic growth. In 1775, Asia accounted for 80% of the world economy. The combined economies of India and China alone represented two-thirds of the global production. In comparison, Europe was an economic dwarf. The global center of power shifted to Europe only between 1750 and 1850, when Europeans humiliated the Asian powers in a series of wars and conquered large parts of Asia. By 1900, Europeans firmly controlled the world's economy and most of its territory. In 1950, Western Europe and the United States together accounted for more than half of global production, whereas China's portion had been reduced to 5%. Under the European Aegis, a new global order and global culture emerged. Today, all humans are, to a much greater extent than what they would usually want to admit, European in dress, thought, and taste. They may be fiercely anti-European in their rhetoric, but almost everyone on the planet views politics, medicine, war, and economics through European eyes, and listens to music written in European modes with words in European languages. Even today's burgeoning Chinese economy, which may soon regain its global primacy, is built on a European model of production and finance. How did the people of this frigid finger of Eurasia manage to break out of their remote corner of the globe and conquer the entire world? Europe's scientists are often given much of the credit. It's unquestionable that from 1850 onward, European domination rested to a large extent on the military-industrial-scientific complex and technological wizardry. All successful late modern empires cultivated scientific research in the hope of harvesting technological innovations, and many scientists spent most of their time working on arms, medicines, and machines for their imperial masters. A common saying among European soldiers facing African enemies was, quote, come what may, we have machine guns and they don't. Civilian technologies were no less important. Canned food fed soldiers, railroads and steamships transported soldiers and their provisions, while a new arsenal of medicines cured soldiers, sailors, and locomotive engineers. These logistical advantages played a more significant role in the European conquest of Africa than did the machine gun. But that wasn't the case before 1850. The military-industrial-scientific complex was still in its infancy. The technological fruits of the scientific revolution were unripe, and the technological gap between European, Asian, and African powers was small. In 1770, James Cook certainly had far better technology than the Australian Aborigines, but so did the Chinese and the Ottomans. Why then was Australia explored and colonized by Captain James Cook and not by Captain Wan Chengzi or Captain Hussein Pasha? More importantly, if in 1770 Europeans had no significant technological advantage over Muslims, Indians, and Chinese, how did they manage in the following century to open such a gap between themselves and the rest of the world? Why did the military-industrial-scientific complex blossom in Europe rather than India? When Britain leaped forward, why were France, Germany, and the United States quick to follow, whereas China lagged behind? When the gap between industrial and non-industrial nations became an obvious economic and political factor, why did Russia, Italy, and Australia succeed in closing it, whereas Persia, Egypt, and the Ottoman Empire failed? After all, the technology of the first industrial wave was relatively simple. Was it so hard for the Chinese or Ottomans to engineer steam engines, manufacture machine guns, and lay down railroads? The world's first commercial railroad opened for business in 1830 by Britain. By 1850, Western nations were crisscrossed by almost 25,000 miles of railroads. But in the whole of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, 
there were only 2,500 miles of tracks. In 1880, the West boasted more than 220,000 miles of railroads, whereas in the rest of the world, there were about 22,000 miles of train lines, and most of these were laid by the British in India. The first railroad in China opened only in 1876. It was 15 miles long and built by Europeans. The Chinese government destroyed it the following year. In 1880, the Chinese Empire did not operate a single railroad. The first railroad in Persia was built only in 1888, and it connected Tehran with a Muslim holy site about six miles south of the capital. It was constructed and operated by a Belgian company. In 1950, the total railway network of Persia still amounted to a meager 1,500 miles in a country seven times the size of Britain. The Chinese and Persians did not lack technological inventions such as steam engines, which could be freely copied or bought. They lacked the values, myths, judicial apparatus, and socio-political structures that took centuries to form and mature in the West and which could not be copied and internalized rapidly. France and the United States quickly followed Britain's footsteps because the French and Americans already shared the most important British myths and social structures. The Chinese and Persians could not catch up as quickly because they thought and organized their societies differently. This explanation sheds a new light on the period from 1500 to 1850. During this era, Europe did not enjoy any obvious technological, political, military, or economic advantage over the Asian powers, Yet the continent built up a unique potential, whose importance suddenly became obvious around 1850. The apparent equality between Europe, China, and the Muslim world in 1750 was a mirage. Imagine two builders, each busy constructing very tall towers. One builder uses wood and mud bricks, whereas the other uses steel and concrete. At first, it seems that there is not much difference between the two methods, since both towers grow at a similar pace and reach a similar height. However, once a critical threshold is crossed, the wood and mud tower cannot stand the strain and collapses, whereas the steel and concrete tower grows story by story as far as the eye can see. What potential did Europe develop in the early modern period that enabled it to dominate the late modern world? There are two complementary answers to this question modern science, and capitalism. Europeans were used to thinking and behaving in a scientific and capitalistic way even before they enjoyed any significant technology advances. When the technological bonanza began, Europeans could harness it far better than anybody else. So it is hardly coincidental that science and capitalism form the most important legacy that European imperialism has bequeathed the post-European world of the 21st century. Europe and Europeans no longer rule the world, but science and capital are growing ever stronger. The victories of capitalism are examined in the following chapter. This chapter is dedicated to the love story between European imperialism and modern science. The Mentality of Conquest Modern science flourished in and thanks to European empires. The discipline obviously owes a huge debt to ancient scientific traditions such as those of classical Greece, China, India, and Islam. Yet its unique character began to take shape only in the modern period, hand in hand with the imperial expansion of Spain, Portugal, Britain, France, Russia, and the Netherlands. During the early modern period, Chinese, Indians, Muslims, Native Americans, and Polynesians continue to make important contributions to the scientific revolution. These insights of Muslim economists were studied by Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Treatments pioneered by Native American doctors found their way into English medical texts, and data extracted from Polynesian informants revolutionized Western anthropology. But until the mid-20th century, the people who collated these myriad scientific discoveries, creating scientific disciplines in the process, were the intellectual elites of the global European empires. The Far East and the Islamic world produced minds as intelligent and curious as those of Europe. However, between 1500 and 1950, they did not produce anything that comes even close to Newtonian physics or Darwinian biology. 
This does not mean that Europeans have a unique gene for science or that they will forever dominate the study of physics and biology. Just as Islam began as an Arab monopoly but was subsequently taken over by Turks and Persians, so modern science began as a European specialty but is today becoming a multi-ethnic enterprise. What forged the historical bond between modern science and European imperialism? Technology was an important factor in the 19th and 20th centuries, but in the early modern era, it was of limited importance. The key factor was that the plant-seeking botanist and the colony-seeking naval officer shared a similar mindset. Both the scientist and conqueror began by admitting ignorance. They said, I don't know what's out there. They both felt compelled to go out and make new discoveries. They both hoped that new knowledge, thus acquired, would make them masters of the world. European imperialism was entirely unlike all other imperial projects in history. Previous seekers of empire tended to assume that they already understood the world. Conquest merely utilized and spread their view of the world. The Arabs, to name one example, did not conquer Egypt, Spain, or India in order to discover something that they didn't know. The Romans, Mongols, and Aztecs voraciously conquered new lands in search of power and wealth, not of knowledge. In contrast, European imperialists set out to distant shores in hope of obtaining new knowledge along with new territories. James Cook was not the first explorer to think this way. The Portuguese and Spanish voyagers of the 15th and 16th centuries already did. Prince Henry, the navigator, and Vasco da Gama explored the coasts of Africa and while doing so, seized control of islands and harbors. Christopher Columbus, in quotes, discovered America and immediately claimed sovereignty over the new lands for the kings of Spain. Ferdinand Magellan found a way around the globe and simultaneously laid the foundation for the Spanish conquest of the Philippines. As time went by, the conquest of knowledge and the conquest of territory became ever more tightly intertwined. In the 18th and 19th centuries, almost every important military expedition that left Europe for distant lands had on board scientists who set out not to fight, but to make scientific discoveries. When Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1798, he took 165 scholars with him. Among other things, they founded an entirely new discipline, Egyptology, and made important contributions to the study of religion, linguistics, and botany. In 1831, the Royal Navy sent the ship HMS Beagle to map the coasts of South America, the Falkland Islands, and the Galapagos Islands. The Navy needed this knowledge in order to tighten Britain's imperial grip over South America. The ship's captain, who was an amateur scientist, decided to add a geologist to the expedition to study geological formations that they might encounter on the way. After several professional geologists refused his invitation, the captain offered the job to a 22-year-old Cambridge graduate, Charles Darwin. Darwin had studied to become an Angelican parson but was far more interested in geology and natural sciences than in the Bible. He jumped at the opportunity, and the rest is history. The captain spent his time on the voyage, drawing military maps while Darwin collected the empirical data and formulated the insights that would eventually become the theory of evolution. On 20 July 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the surface of the moon. In the months leading up to their expedition, the Apollo 11 astronauts trained in a remote, moon-like desert in the western United States. The area is home to several Native American communities, and there is a story, or legend, describing an encounter between the astronauts and one of the locals. One day as they were training, the astronauts came across an old Native American. The man asked them what they were doing there, they replied that they were part of a research expedition that would shortly travel to explore the moon. When the old man heard that, he fell silent for a few moments and then asked the astronauts if they could do him a favor. 
What do you want? They asked. Well, said the old man, the people of my tribe believe that holy spirits live on the moon. I was wondering if you could pass an important message to them from my people. What's the message? Asked the astronauts. The man uttered something in his tribal language and then asked the astronauts to repeat it again and again until they had memorized it correctly. What does it mean? Asked the astronauts. Oh, I cannot tell you. It's a secret that only our tribe and the moon spirits are allowed to know. When they returned to their base, the astronauts searched and searched until they found someone who could speak the tribal language and then asked him to translate the secret message. When they had repeated what they memorized, the translator started to laugh uproariously. When he calmed down, the astronauts asked him what it meant. The man explained that the sentence they had memorized so carefully said, Don't believe a single word these people are telling you. They have come to steal your lands. <laughs>